Everybody, this is the First Lady Erica, your cosmic mama. Uh, just back from Egypt. We had summer break and I'm here with Terry Smith over in Canada. And, hey, Chas <laughs> and I don't know if you wanted to say something really quick. Okay. And Chastity Campbell. Hello. My new friend from that I met in Illinois at the campgrounds, and I'm just happy to be here today. And at first, well, we started the summer in June and we had all these big plans for the summer. And so it's the end of summer break. And I'm going to take the time to just interview different people and talk about this. How was your summer break, right? Like the beginning of school. We're going back to school now. We're getting back to work. It's still, the year is still half full and we still have plenty to do. But uh, I think we probably learned a lot. I'm sure it seems like everybody I've spoken to has learned a lot or has some challenges and some lessons and some uh, uh, victories over the summer. So that's what the next part of our quest is as we flew in and flew out and around the world and the universe and back. We're going to talk to people about summer break. So I will start with Terry. <laughs> <laughs> so Terry, I'm not going to blow up your spot and tell all your business, but um, <laughs> you had some big plans for the summer. Um, I think we could go around and just talk maybe even about just, did you have anything going on with your daughter? Your, and so we could start with children and I'll start with your daughter, like any, any developments and excitement? Well, my daughter is getting married in August. And so... Um, this is a very exciting time for her. She is, um, you know, as a child, of course, we all dream about being the bride and, and everything. And so um, she's had a, a challenging, a challenging couple of months because the venue um, where they were going to have the wedding, there was an accident and some people were injured. So they had to change venues but wow. the venue that they had for the day that they were the venue that they were going to use the day that they had planned for their wedding was not available so they had to change their wedding date Ooh. and so uh, it so it's it's like rolling with what was happening and she's very open to understanding that yes it it it's, was meant to be this way. It's okay, but it still was stressful. So, so um, um, we're just we're just going <laughs> we're going with all of that, and uh, um, it's exciting. It's only um, it's less than four weeks away now. It's about four weeks wow. away. So, wow! So things are are coming along, and and so that's that's been exciting. Um, and of course, as a mother, you go up and down with your daughter with your child as they go through this and you have to be sort of that hold that space for where they are and not get and and hold it so that when they have this breakdown and freak out it's just like you become the voice of reason well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put my little slice in here because I was excited because my son, when I went to Egypt, he spent about three days here alone with the cat. My cat doesn't even ask my son for food. He only asks me. So I'm really excited that we've shifted some responsibilities here at this home. <laughs> that my son actually will feed himself and he will feed the cat. So that's really exciting for me. <laughs> when Chair Chastity, before, you know, I know you, you went to the event and your kids are pretty mature and on their own, but it seemed like you were having some challenges at the beginning of the summer because now you you had some spatial issues. So 
what happened? How did how did you overcome or did the, you know, what did you see develop? Well, we started out this summer with um, a car accident. Mm. Um, my daughter was in a T-bone accident, totaled out her car, and she's still taking care of recovering from that. And then I graduated and I received three degrees and yay, I went back to finish one and they said, well, oh, but if you just take that one more class because you need it for your Pell Grant, you can get three. And I was like, I can do that. (laughs) I said, okay. (laughs) And then um, my middle son graduated from high school So that was a busy month. May was crazy. And then I went to the conference. And um, yeah, last month, I just kind of took it easy and just recouped and concentrated on me. Yeah, me. And so that's what I've been doing is taking care of me. So I went and got pampered tonight. Oh, I got a mani petty. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing. Yeah, but so I know you had come here like, ah, like space, space. Like I, how do I, like I love my kids, but I need some space. Oh. My car has become my office. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Right now, anyways, I mean, like right now, um, I have two at home. One is going to be getting off work in about 20 minutes and get home soon in about an hour. And um, we have learned to use headphones or earbuds. And um, that's how we've been managing to have space. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. Cause I, I, <laughs> right before we got started, I, I walked in to the room and my son was awake and I was like, ah, like every day I'm, I'm startled because I'm like, oh wait a minute, I forgot you live here. Like, oh okay, <laughs> mm-hmm. like oh uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah sometimes I have four kids, boys. Oh. and three boys, one girl, and my oldest boy doesn't live at home. Yes. Yeah. So. And my daughter, she's readjusting to Kansas. She was in Alaska for five years. So, wow, yeah, Alaska, that's amazing. So, I don't want to dig too much into their personal business, but uh, yeah. So, ne- next we talked about like pets and plants and just, I mean, what what was your expectation of the summer anyway, Ch- Chastity? What were you expecting to really get done? Or were you just expecting to cruise? Did you set any goals for yourself? Um, I'm still getting rid of the past stuff from when I was married. And yeah. I am almost done. I, I actually... I don't have much left. So my goals are to be rid of all of that by the time that the end of the year, really. But if I can get it done by the end of summer, that'd be great too. (laughs) I just realized this, that, you know, like the two of you had this in common that um, both of you have a spouse that was deceased, Mm -hmm. that you both in a loving relationship, a good relationship and both, had a spouse that was deceased for how long has it been for you? Eight and a half years. Wow. Yeah. And it hasn't been that long for you, Terry, though. Well, no, it'll be four years in September, but my husband had dementia. So it really goes back longer than that. So really the last uh, eight years or so, nine years have been, were challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't 
you know, I commend you all because I, when I meet people that have been married for a long time, I'm like, you've done the work. Like me, I'm like, I have not done all that work. I've done the work with my son. So that's 16 years of dealing with like um, someone on the spectrum, but with relationships and then the loss, that's um, definitely something amazing. I don't know if you want to share anything about that, Terry or Chastity. I, I don't know. I mean, he he um, was 41 when he passed away and we had been together for, let's see, 15 years. Wow. So um, it was hard adjusting because uh, his family, even though they live in Kansas, they blamed me because he didn't want to do chemo again and that was all his choice um but they blamed me you know so they they needed to have that scapegoat and so I ended up raising my four kids by myself no not really any support um I'm not close to my family my mom and my brother live in I I have I'm the oldest (laughs) I have all brothers and my, they, my mom and my oldest brother from her live in Connecticut. And then I have a brother in um, the Carolinas in Alaska, Tennessee and Nebraska, but I'm not really close to any of them. So it's just been me and the kids and at first, it was really hard trying to figure out how to do everything. And then, you know, we went to grief counseling and stuff like that. But and, and it, everything changed for us because I homeschooled when, if, you know, when I was married. And then they went to public school after that. So I just went with the, the flow, you know, um, and tapped into community resources. And that's... That's how I made it. <laughs> I mean, you you said something pretty profound about having the emotional scapegoat um, because a lot of people use anger to get over grief. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know, Terry, if you wanted to say anything about that. If you, <clears throat> well, I I think um, you know, in in my case, as I said, my husband had dementia. We were married for forty three years, so there was, there was a long relationship. And so going from getting married at a, I I was young, I was 21. So, so having gone through that spectrum of life, right. And um, going to the point point where, you know, with a disease like dementia and he had Lewy body dementia. So it was, it was, it was quick as it, as it happened for him but there was no cure for it there was nothing all you were able to do is just watch somebody and it was very slow um grieving process it wasn't a fast grieving process because every time you go in and I I mean I saw him every day but every day there was because he would he ended up in a nursing home I there got to a point where I wasn't able to to take care of him any longer and so as you every day you would go in and you would see a difference or there would be a plateau and then it would be and it then it would drop and so every day there was a a part of you that was that was um being challenged and losing him and I know it was very difficult for my daughter as well so we we went through a, a process we were fortunate that we my daughter and I are very close so we went through it together um and so the last four years has put me into a different place where I am, I do have a, a, a new partner now, um, but it was, but it, it, it wasn't a slow process. It was a slow process. I mean, I went through a grieving process, 
prior to his, you know, until uh, to his passing. So after he passed, the last four years have been a process of me getting to know who I am, because I had always been the caregiver for, for children, for my mother, for my husband. It was just always caring for someone else. And so the last four years have been about myself and about self-care and self-nurturing and doing what I want to do, how I want to do it. And if I don't feel like cooking supper tonight, then I don't have to cook supper tonight. I don't have to worry like, what's for dinner, mom? You know, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all of that. It's like, you know, it's like, I, it's, it was just about me. But it was also, for me, it was also time to say, yes, there was something missing in my life. And, you know, I can be happy to be myself. I love myself. But when it all comes down to it is I missed having someone in my life. And I'm very fortunate to have found someone who um, is able to fulfill that aspect of myself that I'm, I'm um, wanting to discover again. And I think, are we all in that same category chastity where maybe you not have the the one but you're at that space where you're like I'm ready to say yeah that I want like for myself last year that you know I've definitely dated off and on but I've had these like uh these cruising relationships where you're like you're cruising at a certain altitude, but you're you you kind of know that this is not the one or this is not, you know. I have some friends too that they say, Oh, I'm not gonna date until I find the one. And I'm like, that that's not really how dating works, really, because you kind of gotta <laughs> bring some eggs, right? You gotta you gotta look, you know, you actually have to do that but then I have some people too that maybe they're in relationships and it's not something profound and the love of my life and I'm like well that's okay too you don't have to always be in that state it's okay to not be in that state and I'm just gonna say it sometimes you enter some fuckery <laughs> like maybe you messy right now or maybe you you know or maybe you only want some parts of a relationship but not all aspects of a relationship but then I found myself last year at this point where I finally could say like I, I didn't do any vision boards and I hadn't been doing vision boards for a while I guess because the state of everything around us was so chaotic I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted and I even met somebody during my awakening that was like yes I I love you and I and no, you know and they were like no I was like, I'm not sure that's what I want right now. Like, I don't want to make any promises to anyone right now. But then now I know that I began the journey at the end of the year last year saying, I want. And then I took my trip and I said, show me, God, show me. And, you know, <laughs> I had some ideas, but then people were moved to the left and moved to the right. And then the light was shining. It was like, oh, it was you I was looking for. So I'm really excited, too, to be in, like, or what I feel is a really powerful relationship. I mean, I did our charts the other day, Terry, and I've never yeah. seen a chart with another person that it didn't say um, any any conflicts or things that, like, oh, you're going to have to work on this or struggle with that. And I was like, holy cow, this is actually wow. great. But, yeah, because even in the chart, it, like, you know what I find myself doing too? Like I want, like maybe you want to participate in maybe some old feelings like jealousy or anger. And it's like, nah, it's not even there because you're just used to it. It's like a, a, a built pathway and you want to go down it and you're like, uh, actually, there's really nothing here. I really don't have anything to flip about. I really don't have anything to be chaotic and crazy about. So, huh, this is new. Like it's a new feeling in these new uh, situations that we have but yeah totally we're working our way and I'm noticing that we're in similar situations not just us but just in general and so as as we're doing interviews over this 
what we did this summer, my thought and my my guesstimation is that we'll all be having very similar epiphanies. Mm. You know, and so yeah. I feel like that actually something. So Terry, anytime you want to interrupt me, Terry, you just interrupt me. You just go ahead. On a roll, Eric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I, I think that um, like we're halfway through the summer, right? We, we still have another five and a half, six weeks. You know, I, I guess we kind of say summer is until Labor Day. So we got about six weeks yet. Okay. And I, I know for me, everything was kind of building to this crescendo. And then yes. over the next week, uh, my, my partner is coming to stay with me for a while. So we're going to then see how this is going to uh, transpire. Plus, I've got a wedding happening uh, for my daughter. So that, for me, it's, it's like it's building to a crescendo because I know with regard to the wedding, it's going to be a time of uh, changing um, perspectives. You know, like it's almost like she's no longer my, she's my daughter, but I'm not responsible for her in that same way anymore. She's now a married, going to be a married woman and starting a new life. So, um, and, and it's like contract, you know, we, if we have soul contracts, it's like, yeah, this contract is now coming to, you know, not a total end, but this phase is over. And so I know that there's going to be big shifts. And, and as I said, you know, having lost my husband, having lost her father, the wedding is going to be very emotional, a very mm -hmm. emotional time frame. And I was actually thinking about it earlier today. Like, I better make sure that I'm wearing uh, um, smudge proof mascara that day, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, a lot of emotions that are just going to bubble up without, Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know that I necessarily have to prepare myself other than the fact that I know that that's a possibility, right? So I, I think, and, and you, I, and I know Chastity, you can, you know, like you understand that there's different phases to having mm -hmm. lost someone, right? And this is kind of like that final, not that final, but it's, it's one of those major, um, hurdles that you're going to have to face and you can prepare yeah. all you want, but you don't know what's coming from where. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like every single time there's a shift in anybody's life, you revisit and, and you just never know how everybody's going to react. You never know. And, and it's, uh, I just tell everybody it's it, you don't ever get over it you, it's just different every single stage every single shift it's just different and you have to allow you know um that space to feel because you can't shove it down or it's going to come back up and then it'll take over so if you just let it happen then it's done Mm -hmm. yeah that's what we've learned and 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 having five people <laughs> go through it at one time in one space is a lot especially you know at the different ages and everything yeah you know it's it's crazy it's like a roller coaster sometimes and I think even the animals go through that we have one of our cats um, used to actually um, like sit on Brian and when he was in pain to try I'm sure to comfort him and help him as he was um, in the dying process and um, I see him go through different things as well when we start shifting and having grief again so it's it's just different and I haven't got to go through the the wedding part of it but I know we my kids and I we have talked about it and um as we've talked about you know like does anybody want dad's ring 
Does anybody mm. want to ring? Um, you know, we've talked about having some of his ashes compressed and made into a diamond um, so that that can be taken down the aisle by whomever. Um, we've, we've talked about all kinds of things. At one point, somebody was thinking about getting a tattoo with the ashes, but now you can't do that. So there's all sorts of different um, avenues that we've talked about and how do we want the grief process to look like or how do we want to include dad in our lives as we keep going forward um you know we he was um cremated and so we picked out a star wars box for him <laughs> because star wars was our movie to watch as a family and so that's what we have the ashes in. And, um, you know, his sister, actually, the only one of his family that was still in communication with us, she asked for a tube of ashes because that's what everybody in, uh, um, in her household was doing with people that had passed away. They were you putting them on a Christmas tree within the tube oh, and as a, you know, ornaments, ornamental. So there's all kinds of things. You can have pictures made with their ashes. Um, but I really liked the, um, the compression, making it into a diamond or um, even like into something that's glass that can be carried um, or put like in the bouquet or in the pocket that way you you have a piece of him with you and yeah. and that's what the kids have um, explored and in, in doing for their future um, adventures so is your daughter going to do anything like that no and, and actually it's funny she she specifically said I can't do any of that and she doesn't want even, you know, some people say, well, you can have a, a picture, you can have a table, you can have an extra yeah. setting at a table. She doesn't want any of that. And she said, I was looking forward to him walking me down the aisle, but he's not there. So I don't need anybody to give me away. Oh, wow. Power move. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So and, and I know that it's going to be kind of challenging because. I have somebody in my life and I, I know mm. that she'll look over and she may see someone else. And uh, I know that may be a difficult thing, but it, it's just life goes <sighs> on. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, you know, it will be what it will be. And um, um, you know, her father will be there <laughs> with, with her no matter what. Right. And, and she knows that. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's um it, it's just, you know, and, and we also, she also lost a sister a long time ago as well. So there's just that absence of, of those two people in her life. And, um, and I know that it's going to be very emotional for her, but it's also her wedding day. And so yeah. I know that her excitement will overcome it. She's done a grieving, she's had a grieving process over the springtime you know, where she was going through all of those thoughts. And we talked about it and I said, you're doing it now so that at the time it, you still will think about it, but you will have done your grieving beforehand. So, but, and, and everybody has their own way. There's no right way or wrong way to do it, right. you know, yeah. and, and some people want to include it whether it be a little, um, um, you know, like a little tube but with the ashes or, you know, in a necklace or with, as in the glass or whatever, and then some prefer not to. And, and it's all, you know, if anybody's listening to this, there's no one way to do it. If you, it's a yeah. personal process that, that you have to do, you go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's remarkable because it seems like you're all communicating very well with your children. And um, instead of dictating the process, it's like everyone's participating in the process. 
and not ignoring the feelings and actually working and doing the work, processing and doing the work and doing it your way. Um, I wrote the other. I I just want to say that I, I think what happens is a lot of people don't process it. Mm -hmm. And they hold it back and they don't acknowledge that they're in a grieving process. And it could be grieving because they've lost a family, but it could be grieving because they're separated. There's a divorce. There there could be so many ways of grieving and they don't and people don't acknowledge that that is grief as well. Uh, When when we do when we when when a family splits when a family moves when they move change location that's a grieving process too Mm -hmm. and and it's something that um we all have it they're very strong emotions changing a job is a grieving process and and if we don't acknowledge it and say that i'm grieving this is a stressful time in my life then we end up repressing it and it'll come up uh you know it'll show its ugly head in another way Right. Um, Part of the oil chakra ceremony is talking about this same thing because the other side of love is the fear of loss. Mm -hmm. And if you're living with unable to process the loss that you've had in the past, then you'll have fear of loving in the future. So for you to be able to love properly, you have to deal with loss and future loss and past loss because the fear of pain stops us from loving. And so if we can never get over the one pain that we've already got to deal with, then, you know, there's a traffic jam in this heart process where you can't allow new people into your heart until you begin to process this pain and just accept that in life, this experience, I don't know if this, maybe it did. It probably crossed your mind, but in the process of me meeting someone new, the thought of, well, what if I lose them actually did cross my mind. And I was like, ugh. Ooh. But then it's like, do you want to go forward? Because I'm, I literally considered, do you want to go forward? Because to become attached to someone, you know that at some point, one of us is going to transition at some point. And do you, can you deal with it? Will you um, deal with love? Because dealing with love is also leading to dealing with loss. I don't know if they do. Uh, well, I, I, I'll say, I'm. I mean, at my age, of course, I'm. I'm older than both you girls are, so I. It, it's part of the process. It is like, hey, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow, mm-hmm. and so you know what? Isn't it better to have two years, ten years, five years? 15 years with someone and and you sharing love than to say to be sitting on the couch by yourself on a Saturday evening and saying I wish I had somebody in my life you know Mm -hmm. like the fear of loss is um is much less than the joy of of love Mm. and 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 spending uh quality time with someone whether it's and and i'm sure chester you you knew that the qual the, the last quality that you had with your husband as as did my daughter and i have with even though he wasn't in the same space it was quality time we were able to express our love for this for him and and mm-hmm. it didn't matter, um, you know, that they didn't respond in the way that you know we expected them to. We were able to express it, and so um, that's more important than than the fear because you know ultimately we believe in the creation and that the life is eternal, and and you know we're gonna be with them again, in some form or other. So, right. um, you know, it's, it's part of that, that whole ability to overcome our fear and, and um, 
be in a space to find the, the joy in love. Definitely. Um, I didn't know if you had anything to add to that, Chastity. Um, I didn't really even focus on finding anybody else. And I hadn't, I didn't even really think about it until a couple of years ago when I, the kids were getting old enough that they were venturing away from me. And that's when I was like, oh, I really don't want to end up alone. <laughs> I guess I better start looking again. <laughs> and, you know, I was so focused on getting the kids, you know, adjusted and stabilized so that they could have consistency that I didn't even consider that. And it was funny because um, the people that we went to uh, grief counseling um, where the, the adults were in one room and the kids would go according to age groups and they learn different coping skills. And um, there was several women in there and men that had lost some, their spouse and they quickly picked up and got married again. And I was just like, wow. You know, but I realized that the difference between them and me was that they had like parents around them. They had a support system where I didn't. And so I don't know if that made a difference as far as, you know, when I felt like I was able to move on and start looking again, um, but maybe it did because I, I was just so focused on on surviving and making sure that my kids had the support that they needed that I did, it didn't even come across my mind. So <laughs> and I had people asking me, well, how come you haven't moved on? And I'm like, I don't know. I, it's not really something that I've, I am interested in right now. I'm trying to get my kids raised. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's um, everyone in their own timing and desire. I mean, everybody has their own speed for things. Again, the truth uh, belongs to the seeker. And if you're, you're dealing with that, that's not something, you know, it's even um, my sister and I discussed this, like when you're angry with someone, like because someone hurt your feelings or something, who, who is going to tell you when you should get over it? Right. I mean, of course, we all would like to get over things quickly because that's what we desire to do, but no one can say how long we should grieve before we should, uh, move on to someone else in such a situation. You know, I know you've seen it before where someone's replacing someone else, but then they spend the whole time comparing the person to the other person. And that new person doesn't get that full credit for being who they are. Yeah. They don't get the full uh, re reception of love sometimes because you're competing with this person. So it, you have to have space mm -hmm. for the new person. And if you're still full, you, you can't, you know, you can't give them that definitely space. definitely full. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were full. And then, cause you're not, you're, you're, you're like you say, you got five people that you're mm -hmm. de dealing with, not one. So right. it's definitely going to be a little different from you. So, Onward to, I don't know if you had anything else to say about love. So we're all in the game now. We're, <laughs> we're playing to win. We got our cards on the table, doubling down. I can say that I knew I was expecting it. Um, this, the, the, the vision I had is completely different. And I remember when we sat at the table who were we with? Do you? <laughs> we were with Erin's girlfriend. And she said, oh. 
said, I drew this picture and I was like, I had the labels of what mentally, physically I had. The, and she said, yes, but be careful with the list. And I was like, what did she mean by that? And it's like, uh, yeah, it did switch up a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you lose a little bit of, you know, change my regards and not all aspects of the list, but maybe a little, a little different. Um, so there was love. Now with the work, for me, I didn't do, well, actually my trip was a work vacation. It wasn't like a vacation vacation. Yeah. And so with the work vacation, I swear I had the most difficulties. I had a video camera, the files wouldn't transfer, internet wouldn't work. And I was just having, I started going live because I couldn't save anything. And I was so in fear of recording and not being able to save. And then, um, oh my God, I worked my butt off y'all. It was really hot over there. And I did a lot of walking, (laughs) a lot of walking, but, um, I think I thought I was gonna be given more like an assignment. And what happened was I was more of a student that allowed that was allowed to learn on my own. And it, that wasn't what I expected. But because I was doing more self-discovery, I feel like I came up with the best uh, meditations that I've ever had in life, the best uh, affirmations that I've ever had in life. I was tinkering with photography and color and I, like I ended up doing a lot. And to the point where all my loose files on my computer, I got them all in folders, all my pictures, I got them in folders. And, and I was like, wait a minute, I didn't even know I had this kind of energy. But, you know, <laughs> outside of the house when you're not cooking and cleaning and doing all this stuff. And then I'm like, oh, look, some, you know, like I discovered some things inside myself and some new energy that I did not know I had. And um, even the partnerships with uh, the trip, I changed partnerships and learned and went places that I hadn't even expected to go. And and so it was a. Uh, what do you say? Like it was a blowout. It was a blowout. And I'm looking forward to being able to share the things that I learned, the meditations, and um, even being able to do trips with people in the future. Because now if I learn, I learned everything that was good, but I learned so much that was not so good that I know that if someone comes with me on a trip, I know I got everything covered and I've experienced so much over there. I was supposed to stay 30 days. I stayed 40 days. And (laughs) and so nothing was as exactly as planned. And and, uh, at one point I was telling my sister some of the struggles I was having. And she said, I'm so sorry. And I said, I don't know why you're sorry for me. This is actually the best. It's the best because all that I was going through, it's all just a learning experience for me. The more you find what you don't want, the more you find what you really do want. You know what I mean? Like uh, being disillusioned, right? That's when you go past the illusion, right? You become disillusioned is even better. It's even better. I think everything worked out as planned. And at some point I thought, oh, maybe I'll come home early. And I made some moves to to go out on my own. And I ended up staying actually longer. But once I got self-reliant and determined that, no, your, your vision is clear, your mind is clear, trust yourself, and went out on my own, and then the trip just supernova for me it was just amazing everything was just amazing after that and then uh i got everything i wanted and more so check plus 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 so i don't know if anybody had any work assignments for the summer but charity you're blowing it out she's gonna be really low-key she's gonna really be low-key about it but you 
kind of got it going on since the conference. You weren't expecting any of these things to happen. So Mm-mm. what are some of the things that happened? You had some great interviews and then you've been invited on some missions. And so just talk about it. Well, um, you were talking about how you just um, allowed things to take place and you gave yourself that freedom to go with the flow kind of thing and just see what happened. And that's pretty much what I did when I was at the conference Mm -hmm. is I was like, well, let's just see what happens because I don't know what I'm doing from here, (laughs) you know? And um, so I just took every opportunity, no matter how afraid I was, I just kept taking those steps into the opportunities that as they presented themselves and man, it just, it blew up and I'm still getting I think you came to the table. You came to the table and you got, did you experience the meditation? Yeah. And then that's how we and you got in a conversation. We discussed the meditation. Then all of a sudden you were in a regression Mm -hmm. it wasn't really a regression he was asking me a bunch of questions about different projects because i i've had memories but i never wanted to explore them i was afraid of them and so um when they first started coming up for me i I said, no, 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 I'm just going to back off and concentrate on life. And so that's what I did. And then once I started trying this year, I I would say is my year of self-exploration, learning who I am, because, you know, now I have three adult kids and only one in high school. And I'm, I'm getting closer to that empty nest. And and I didn't know who I was um, after mom. And so I started exploring with that. And um, I was dating and it was, it ended up not being that um, a good relationship for me to be in. And so I was like, okay, I'm back to just me. And, and I was like, well, I'm just going to start doing what I've wanted to do. So I started my bucket list <laughs> and, I, and um, I came to the conference and, and I just, you know, as the opportunities presented themselves, I just remembered something that I had heard um, before I got married and it was do it afraid, always mm. do it afraid because that's like the biggest regret that anybody that gets close to, close to the end of life, they wish they would have done it afraid. And even when Brian was still alive, um, he told me, he said, live every single day like it's your last because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And um, I said, okay. And he's like, throw all those crazy rules and that we had from, you know, I call them filters now, but they were religious expectations, religious rules, um, religious traditions, all of those, those expectations that people silently put on you because they, they see you becoming a certain thing. And, and he, he said, throw all that away and do you do what you need to you know teach the kids to to live everything to its fullest and and I had been concentrating on the kids so much that I forgot to do it for myself and so I was like okay this year I'm going to do me because in August you know I'm the big five oh oh wow (laughs) on the fifth (laughs) And, and I was like, you know, it's, it's time to start doing me. So do it afraid. 
So I'm trying to get to the part where you <laughs> you meet James Rink and you oh. get interviewed and you get to talk to Yetis in the woods <laughs> and you get to she's being really low key, y'all. So you're like busting <laughs> loose and showing all your talents to everybody. And it's like, oh, my gosh. And I can confirm her conversation with Yeti because I heard them. I heard them. And the same (laughs) things that I heard, she heard. But she she heard the pings and the portals. And I'm like, oh, we were on the other side down the down the path. And she she was on one side of the path and we were on the other. And she heard it. And I was like, yep, I heard it. I heard it. (laughs) Laura heard it. We recorded yeah, it. Was- so then you get to hang out with James Rink and you get to do this stuff. And then now, now yeah. what's coming? Um, I'm going to the Montauk Adventure in New York um, next month with James. And there's going to be several people. I don't know who all's going to be there. I, kn- I know some of them mm-hmm. from the conference, but like, um, I don't know like totals or anything like that. But- no problem. Well, what is, what is your goal? Like, what is it you're going to be teaching or sharing while you're there? What's your purpose in doing the Montauk event? There's a portal that's supposed to open up. That's a 40 year portal um, from 1943 till now. And there's um, people that are stuck in between. Oh, wow. And we're going to try to... Um, tap into them which is what i will do and then um hi hey tell them hey (laughs) it's okay my cat walks across the screen sometimes and my son (laughs) yeah (laughs) so hold on just a second let me tell him that i'm doing this so i don't know terry had you ever heard about that at montauk um you know, now that she's saying it, I have heard about it, uh, but she has a lot more information. I, I just, I remember her hearing or hear uh, or reading something about it. So, wow, that's really interesting. Wow, I know. Yeah, I was invited, and I always say, yeah. I have no idea what <laughs> I'll be like. Yeah, I'm coming because it's exciting, <laughs> and if you got a chance to, oh, I'm co-. so yeah. I, I was invited, but with not really understanding I was like a tag along person so I'm excited because you're going and you're like uh what would you say your role is again I don't I don't really know like well it's either called. you're not an oracle you're uh you're a, you're like a, a conduit or psychic conduit. Remote mm-hmm. viewer there's probably going to be some um channeling um I, I just usually go with the flow of things. I don't get it where you fit in on everything. You know, yeah. I just do it. <laughs> and so, um, so I, this is like a team effort. It's not like completely relying on you. It's like a team effort of like uh, people yeah. that are interested, people that want to know about these souls, and people who want to help these souls cross over. Is that what it is? Uh huh. That uh, do some clearing um to do some healing for those souls and for us because you know some of us were part of montauk and um and some of the a lot of us from what i understand are ssp survivors and so we're going to be um supporting and encouraging each other as we dive into memories or emotions that arise from the experiences of being back in a place that wasn't necessarily good to us or good for us or maybe we weren't the best version of ourselves and so that's you know there's it's it's going to be a lot of healing and clearing is what I'm getting 
So I'm going to just read a little bit about it because it says the Montauk Project is a conspiracy theory, of course, that alleges there were a series of United States government projects conducted at Camp Hero or Montauk Air Force Station in New York for the purpose of developing psychological warfare techniques and exotic research, including time travel. The story of the Montauk Project originates in the Montauk Project series of books by Preston Nichols which we know that just because it's in a book or it's labeled fiction doesn't mean it is fiction. So it intermixes these stories with <laughs> stories about the Bulgarian experiment. So we're gonna have to find out about that. But these stories of the Montauk Project circulated um, in the early 1980s, according to UFO research researcher Jacques Vallier, that the experiments seem to have originated with highly questionable accounts and um, Preston Nichols and Al Bellick, who claim to have recovered repressed memories of their own involvement and claim periodic abduction and his continued participation against his will. So the claims of Parapsychology, psychology, electrical engineer, and nearing. Wow. And these center on the topics, which include the books, military experiments, time travel, teleportation, mind control, contact with extraterrestrials, and a fake Apollo moon landing framed as developments followed the 1943 Philadelphia experiment. Wow. So this this is originating from the book and claims of other people who have memories of this project. So, wow, definitely going to be needing some healing for people who have participated. So are the other team members coming? Would you say that they feel a connection that they were also participants or is this mm -hmm. something where they just want to help? I think it's both. They did open the um, adventure to people that wanted to come that necessarily weren't part of that. Right. Um, but they wanted to help and assist those of us that have in and um, creating a healing atmosphere. And also some people believe that the, the ship will reappear in the waters off of the beach there. Um, that some people think that the ship will actually itself appear, but the majority are of the belief that there will be like an indentation in the water where it might be. And I personally don't have um, expectations built on any of that. Um, my interest is, is the healing portion of it and um, just being of service to those that want that healing, that are seeking that transition. And honestly, I, you know, I didn't even realize how much um I had been involved in um but I've been finding out more even since the conference in May but how, what what triggered me was James was sharing his testimony very quickly with me and going through some slides on his laptop and he got to um the Montauk project and the praying mantis being was there and I lost all of my muscle strength and pretty much went down to the floor. And, and he asked me, he said, so do you think that you were part of this? And I said, well, my body does. <laughs> I said, or else I wouldn't have had that kind of muscle response. Like I turned into spaghetti. And so I started sitting with that and um, allowing myself to feel 
um, if there were any emotions and, you know, and so I've, that's what kind of work I've been doing with myself since the conference is just allowing memories to come and just sit with them. Um, I've drew some pictures that I've shared with James that of things that I have experienced or seen um, either while talking to him or that I um, experienced when like I, I was touring with my family, the Biltmore Estates. Oh, and yes. I got triggered there. You know, I didn't even know any of this stuff back then. That was in like 2012. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. And nobody did. But I got to this certain part in this, the estate and it made me physically ill. I thought that it was my blood sugars, but I wanted to throw up and I sat down and tried to get myself back together. And it just, you know, I stood back up and tried to continue with some of the tour and I had to leave the building. I had to leave the main estate house because it was making me physically ill. And I went and walked around the gardens and that was where I felt okay. <laughs> So my daughter just came in the room now. <laughs> that, that's fine. Um, we, we won't stay too much longer. I'm really glad that you're touching on this, this big plan that you have. Um, um, I'm really excited for you because it's just like, um, Chastity's out of the closet, child. She's been <laughs> keeping yeah. all her talents, but now she's really been thrust forward even with some things with maybe working on big plans in the future for um, medical healing of people and technology. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited for you that you're pushing forward with that. Terry, did you have any like breakthroughs um, in that category for this summer or is it like still on the cusp of well, you know what, I um, have spent a lot of time exploring the quantum realms uh, in my meditations and just seeing things from uh, a different perspective than I have been in and um, opening up to more of the information coming through that quantum realm. And it, it's like the information, what... There's always more to the story than we have been told. And so it's like being able to take that step away from it instead of being pulled into the emotional part and, and that feeling part and, and taking the step back and just taking that overview and looking at things from there. And um, just earlier today, I, I did a session with someone and she said, oh, are you going to teach some classes? And I said, um, I'm learning, I'm still learning. And so I, before I teach something, I want to know what I'm going to, I, I have to process this because it's different than what I had expected it. And, and, you know, um, Chastity, you said that you've had, you got three degrees. Um, you know, if I, you don't mind me asking what they were, but also I'm sure that as you have completed those degrees, it's like, yeah, that's only the beginning of a book. There's so much more to explore and understand. And just like you said, with the whole thing with the experiment, it's like, yeah, but what, but what else am I not asking? You know, because you probably have parameters that you're asking, but you almost want to get into another space and look from it from another view. And what is actually, what is this all about? Like, what is this? You know, there's more answers. There's more questions to be asked, and it's finding the right questions to ask. So yeah, my my degrees, they're all associate degrees. Um, one is in general education, and liberal arts is another, and then the other one is in science, and it's specifically STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, when I was, before I was married, I was going to school to a four-year college um, and I was studying molecular biology. 
And at that time, I was being really, they were steering us into cloning and bioweaponry. And I didn't want to be a part of that. So I dropped out. And mm. I got married and had kids and was a homeschool mom. And so then my kids started graduating from high school and going to college themselves. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go finish my degree. I don't have to get that four year thing, but you know, at least to say I finished my associates, that'd be fun. So that's what I did. And I ended up with three. So well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. So do you, I have a, a question. So do you think you were saying into cloning molecular biology and that, do you think that you were being uh, watched, you know, because of your experience with your previous experience? Do you think they had you tagged? Yeah. Yeah. Later, um, that was in the 90s. Um, I dropped out, I think it was 98. And um, by that time, I actually, um, I was taking developmental embryology and I, I couldn't do it anymore. Like they were just all about cloning and, and I dropped out. That was, that was it. That was the, I've had enough <laughs> because we, we had to write a paper on what we thought That's about bad. it morally. And, um, I, I didn't want it. Um, that was when I found out about Planned Parenthood um, selling body parts of aborted fetuses. And then I also found out about um, college females selling their eggs so they could pay to go to school. And I was just like, what? You know, and that was just too much for me. I, you know, a lot of the people that I went to school with were a lot younger than me and I just didn't want to have any part of that and also the professor that I had was glorifying Hitler thanking mm. him that he did all these atrocities because he advanced science and I was just like oh I gotta get out of here <laughs> I can't do this so I dropped out um but yeah I definitely feel like I've always been a targeted individual. Um, I didn't really have those kind of words to label the situations that I found myself in a lot of times, but I knew there was something different about me and I didn't know why. And honestly, I didn't try to, or even allow myself to explore that until um, I would say probably the last year or two is when I really started exploring and allowing myself to be with that. And, um, you know, I've, I've had like realizations uh, things that I felt that I could have possibly done but for a long time my filter was very religious and I didn't believe in reincarnation so that really limited some of the things that were memories that were coming back to me I was like how can that be maybe that's just memory in the DNA you know my ancestor was that However it works, it's there. Um, but I was watching Michael Tellinger talk about Adam's calendar. And I, I was fascinated with Michael Tellinger for a while. And I wanted to go to South of Africa so that I could explore the places that he was exploring. And, and the closest that I got in getting connected to him was that contact in the desert in 2019. And um, 
I got to talk to him. And so that was enough satisfaction. But what I had discovered is when he was showing and talking about Adam's calendar, I started recalling events and then the psychic that they had on the tour that I was watching would talk about what I had just remembered. And I was like, what? <laughs> How did that just happen? And I, I always felt when I was taking that developmental embryology class that I had, I, I already had that cloning experience. Like I had already been involved in genetics like that somehow, but I, I didn't understand why I even felt that way. I didn't know how to explore that at all. Um, and so when I started having the recall of it, you know, um, 14 years later, <laughs> I had more of a mindset to allow myself to explore that. And um, I went so far with it as to allowing myself to say, yeah, somehow I'm connected to some genetic experiments that did involve cloning, but I don't know anything else than, you know, from that point on, I just allowed myself that. And now that I'm talking about it, I'm thinking, okay, there's another thing that I need to explore. Um, so I will <laughs> um, add it to my list of things, but that's, that's what I'm going through now that I have um, let all these worms out of the can in Missouri or not Missouri, in Illinois at that conference is that was like my big aha moment of allowing myself to come to terms with anything that wants to come to the surface. And I do talk to um, a therapist um, and, you know, I talked to her, I said, uh, to what extent should I allow myself to get involved with these memories that are coming up? because I don't, I already have chronic PTSD. I don't want to make myself worse. <laughs> you know, I want to make myself be the best version of me that I can be. And I want to help others that are like me do the same. So she suggested that, you know, instead of necessarily, she said, is it really important to remember all of the details of this? And I said, no, I guess not. I said, but it does help confirm things. Um, I, I, she said, well, maybe just try allowing the feeling because um, how we got started working together was um, I had a lot of chronic pain and um, she does a technique. I can't remember what it's called now, but she uses like a pointer and when your eyes start to skip and stutter, it connects to that memory. And there's like these folders in your, your neuron that remember every um, thing according to the emotion. Mm. And so the body keeps scores, the book that she really likes to explain that, um, how our body stores all of this trauma according to emotions. So it doesn't, that it could be, completely two different situations but the same emotion comes up and connects those two and it's stored in this file in your in your nervous system and it leads that that nerve leads to a certain point in your body and causes you to be a, you know uncomfortable and in pain and but once you release those emotions then you can heal it's, you know, letting go of stored trauma, according to emotions. And so that's how I started working with her. And so we allow me to feel the um, emotions that connect to these different areas of my body that I have chronic pain. In. Um, I was diagnosed in 2000, 
one, I believe, that I they said that I had um, chronic inflammation and fibromyalgia, and um, and also chronic fatigue. And so I've been doing everything possible since then to get better. And this was a modality that I thought was really cool and it has helped. I had a lot of back pain before and mm -hmm. a lot of that has been released. Um, and, and it comes up at different times in my life as emotions are coming up and it has actually resurfaced. And I did go to the doctors that did an x-ray they said that I had degenerative lower lumbar um, or in, in my lower lumbar, I, I had degenerative um, something disease. And, and there was another area like in my hips and in my pelvis area that I had that there. And um, I went to an intuitive doctor who was um, looking at that with me and he started describing the pain that he was picking up on that I had at the time. And I said, so what causes this? And he said, well, somebody that's um, worked 45 years and is retiring from working at like spirit or Boeing that's been um, doing laborers, hard laborers work on cement floors. And I just looked at him and I said, you know, I would have had to start doing that at age five. <laughs> and and he's new to the SSP information and everything. So um, he, he just looked at me and I had been talking to him about James and his book and sharing that with him. And I was explaining to him how a lot of the SSP people's bodies have a lot of um, older, like senior problems and we're not that age. And um, he, he goes, oh, this is what you were talking about. And I said, yeah, I have never done anything like that. I haven't even worked a full-time job since like 1993. <laughs> and he was just like, wow, okay, I get it. And so for me, he had an aha moment, but for me, it was confirmation that something did really happen to me I was in this program you know and it did affect me so you know that's the kind of things that have been happening since um Illinois the conference is you know just confirmations of things like that and um so now I'm just talking about it <laughs> you know, allowing, giving that allowance. Can I, I, I ask you uh, just, I have two questions. One of them is, <clears throat> so you were studying like a molecular biology. What made you decide to study that when you went to college or university? What was <laughs> it that brought you, it, you know, okay, you were studying about the embryo, like, but how would you have been pulled into studying that? Like, was there something that that said, "Oh, Chastity, you're gonna, you're, you're, you're gonna have to do this," or, or how <laughs> how did you get pulled into it? Because it's almost like there was some kind of a program set for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was already a pharmacy technician. I became a pharmacy technician when I turned eighteen. I actually um, worked up at the hospital locally and as a high school student in personnel and the pharmacy needed some help during the um, winter time their tube system was being redone and so they asked if I would be a runner and I was like oh yeah yeah so I was doing that and um they asked if I wanted to be a pharmacy technician. And I was like, yes. And so when I graduated, that's what I did. And I went into intravenous admixtures. I worked every single floor in the hospital. Um, I, my main floors were cranial spinal rehabilitation unit, um, the telemetry and the oncology floor. But I also, because I worked in what we called IVAD, um, and I started making the intravenous solutions. 
And um, then I would work down in the basement and I got to where I was in charge. I was training people to work with me at my team. And then I started having problems in my hands. They said that I had carpal tunnel syndrome. When I finally turned it in, I went and had a nerve conduction um, done. And he said, I don't know what you have, but it is not carpal tunnel syndrome. So I ended up losing my job and um, I was going to school because I didn't know what else to do. I had, I was 19 years old. I loved my job and I was making almost $20 an hour and I didn't even go to school. <laughs> and so I was looking for something to replace that. So I just started going to school and I was undetermined when I was going at that point. And I took, um, I was taking my biology class and my teacher was sick. And this other person came in and started teaching the class. And we were studying about flowers and the genetics of a flower. And I, this lady just triggered me. I was like, I want to learn everything that you're talking about, about this genetic stuff. This is cool, you know? And before, you know, I was taking Spanish and I was taking drama and history, all those psych classes and stuff like that. And I had um, my uh, drama teacher, she was trying to get me to go into drama. <laughs> and I was like, no, I had enough drama in my life. I don't want no more. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ain't gonna create it and um but when this lady started talking about all this genetic stuff about flowers and I, I was enthralled and so I stayed after class and I talked to her she worked where I had worked but just in a different department and she said well what about um the subject that I was teaching captured you and I chat. said the genetics the genetics of it that was really cool the splicing the gene splicing and and um, creating a new type of flower by the splicing and I was just like wow that is so cool and she said well um she said, I think that you should go into what's called molecular biology because it's, it's that that um, captures all of what you're describing that is interesting to you. And so that's I, what I did. I think it's fascinating because I think it's like uh, you find people in SSP, they're drawn to going to work for the police they're drawn to go into the military or they're drawn to becoming your old job, probably. Mm -hmm. But then you're talking about the things that you all were working on at the job. And it sounds like um, you, you said something. I don't know if it was the spine, but it was like the regeneration or, or something. And it made me think this is probably the thing, like when you think about the problems that you're going through in your own body, that at 19, you were actually working on what the cure for probably what's going on in your own body right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's very uncanny. <laughs> yeah. That that yeah. should not be that, that you're, and then that you're having these, issues and then I wonder if you had kept working that job would you still physically have these problems mm -hmm. and you're not doing it is it a penalty maybe for not going forward in that career like some type right. of punishment maybe to, this is the thing that crossed my it's mind crazy oh, yeah that's... because you know I was always very active I I did not <laughs> I did not like to jiggle. And so if I jiggled, I ran an extra mile or two. I, I lifted weights. I lifted weights so much 
that I had to wear guys' jeans because women's jeans did not fit me. I had huge eyes and calves, thighs and calves. Like um, I, I remember leg pressing four hundred pounds. That was my workout, <laughs> and um, and I played volleyball. I was ambidextrous when I played volleyball and I played every single position. So nobody knew what I was going to do. Um, and, you know, I ran track, I ran long distance. I did cross country. Um, I started trying to do cross country when I was going to my four year college. But by then that was when I had started having all of these different things happening to me. And it was like my body was just spazzing out. Um, I got shin splints. I had never had shin splints. You know, I stayed after work and would run around the track and just run and run and run and run because we had, uh, uh, I don't, it was, it was called a, well, it was a gym. You could go and swim, you could go run, lift weights, ride bikes. I mean, it was the full gamut and it was for hospital employees. And so I worked from like 1.30 to 10, which was perfect for me. Those were always my hours. I was a second shifter. Even as a kid, I hated getting up and going to school. Um, I, I, I would go work out for like two hours after work. And then all of a sudden my wrists aren't hurting. And it went all the way up. It was like a catch right here, my elbow and my shoulders and my neck. And they wanted to cut me in all of those places to loosen it up so that my nerves weren't pinched. And I was like, and this was on both sides. And I was like, no, mm -mm, I'm 19 years old. I had already decided before that nerve conduction study person told me don't let them cut on you I'd already decided I didn't want them kind of scars um, but they confirmed that there was something else going on so from 19 um, that was 1994 yeah 1994 until 2001 I was trying to figure out why is my body falling apart all of a sudden I can't do anything my back slid all over the place like it just was spaghetti. Um, I was tired. I started having like seasonal depression. So I would, I would lay in tanning beds so that I wouldn't get depressed. It was crazy, you know, and I didn't know what to do with all of it. I just felt like everything just all of a sudden flipped on me. And so I started trying to go to school. And then when I decided that I didn't want to go into those things and be used to do something that I felt was morally wrong. And, you know, why do I want to make a biochemical weapon or virus or anything like that bacteria when we got enough of that kind of stuff? We were studying Ebola, you know, and I, I didn't want to contribute to those things I wanted to do something positive like find a cure for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or something or you know dementia that's what I wanted to do but they they were just clone bioweapons clone bioweapons and that's nope just it's interesting because it's like it shows the mindset I always wonder Who's the person who makes the fake phone calls on the plane when <laughs> the towers are, you know, who's the, who's the guy that works at CERN, you know, like who's, yeah. who's the person who creates this thing. And you're like, what, what are your, what's your moral, uh, you know, yeah. what, where, where's your integrity or morality? And it's like, who are the people that, that do these things like the crisis yeah. actors and actresses that yeah. go around and help terrorize the world and mm -hmm. 
we just don't have the heart to do it and don't understand it. And I think that's why a lot of people don't believe that it could even happen because they're thinking, who who would do that? Nobody right. would do that. And and no, somebody's yeah, doing it. What just happened. <laughs> yeah, somebody's doing it. Somebody's so, doing it. Yeah. Most yeah. definitely. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Uh, well, Terry. <laughs> you got the origin story. I got the origin story. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and I'm I'm going to ask you just on a personal note mm-hmm. about your husband. Okay. You know you mm-hmm. you you met and it changed your life. Um, and un- unfortunately, he left you far too early. But. Um, do you want to just share that beautiful part of your life? Just okay. okay. Yeah. How did how did you, if you don't mind us asking, how did you how did you meet and what was it that um, um, sh- that that shifted you and 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 brought you your children brought brought you into a different lifestyle? Okay. Um, oh, so. In 1999, um, I had just decided I'm going to have um, a baby, and um, I always wanted to be a mom, but I had decided that I really didn't um, want or need to have a man in my life, and so um, I had my daughter. And I was going to church and I had met some people in church that um, had visions. They were, they called themselves seers. And um, it was me and two other ladies and we would meet and talk about just things, you know, um, we called it iron sharpening iron because, you know, we were in the religious traditions back then and um, my daughter got to be about two and she was with some kids, her age, some girls, and they were, these little girls started talking about, well, my daddy does this. My daddy does that. And my daughter was like, oh. and they said, so what is your daddy doing? She says, I don't know. (laughs) And I was just like, oh, so um, I decided that I was going to make a list of what I wanted for a husband. And it was two pages front and back. And I started praying over it. And um, I shared it with, I was in Mary Kay. And I shared it with my um, sponsor and she says, Hey, I think this guy that you're supposed to marry is at my church. Well, every time we went to different churches and every time that I went to go to her church to meet this guy, he was never there. And I was like, what makes (laughs) you think that I'm supposed to marry this person? And she said, well, he fits a lot of your list. And I said, "Hmm, okay. So I don't remember how long exactly it took, but I finally um, was at a service that he was at and they had curtains that they drew back that presented the choir and the the band. And he played the trumpet and he's like the last person to be revealed. And as soon as I saw him, I was, I saw us getting married. I, he, I saw him lift the veil over my face and, and I heard, I now pronounce you man and wife. And I was like, that's, that's who I'm supposed to marry. Well, I still didn't know who she was talking about because she, she didn't say anything because he hadn't been shown yet. So before she even had a chance to say anything, I had that vision and I'm like, Hey, that's the guy right there. And she goes, how'd you know that? <laughs> and I 
what was like because and I told her about what I had just seen and heard and she was like oh my goodness wow that's pretty cool so her husband's like "Mm -mm, you're not playing matchmaker if this is going to happen it's going to happen naturally well Mary Kay had um, come up with some men's products and I didn't have a man to test these on (laughs) (laughs) I was aiming to get one (laughs) And after service, when he was walking around, I just went straight up to him and I said, hey, I'm new here and I sell Mary Kay and um, I am single and we have some men's products (laughs) and I need somebody to give me an opinion on them. Can that be you? And he was just like, what? (laughs) You single? I heard single. (laughs) That's what I heard. It's single. <laughs> and so he was like, okay. And so he filled out the little card with his information. And I tore it apart because the other side had mine. And I gave him my information. And I said, I'll be in touch. And so I got my daughter from the nursery. And I went home. And oh, he was driving by me with his friends. And I said, Hi. And, you know, I didn't see him for a while after that. And what I found out was that his family was moving from the city way far out there. And um, they were really busy because it was a lot of, it was at least three to 400 miles different from where they were moving and uh, from and to. And so that was how we met. and uh let's see as far as like during the relationship how we um started going down the road of um change i guess shifting our perspectives was i i've always um been a seer i um have what some people call light language in church, we call it speaking in tongues. Um, And um, I've just always known, I have like this knowing, I've always been able to give like words of wisdom, encouragement, knowledge, affirmations, um, that sort of thing. Just this really strong inner intuition intuition that I followed. Um, I did have boundaries as far as like, what I would and what I wouldn't do. And um, I started seeing things in the church that I didn't agree with. And I just kind of waited because I was of the mindset that my husband was our leader. And so I wouldn't like whisper in his ear things that were going to manipulate him into believing something. I wanted him to see it for himself. And one day he came home and he was like, listen to this. And I was like, okay. So I listened to it and I just started snickering because he saw it. He finally saw it. And I was just like, great. So now what do we do? And um, we quit church. Um, We tried to speak out against it and we ended up actually getting kicked out. (laughs) And especially me. Um, And uh, we started watching um, shows like Star Trek or Star Trek. And uh, we already were watching Star Wars. That was like our all time favorite. And Stargate. um, Did you watch Stargate? Stargate. We watched all of Stargate. And oh, man, that triggered me so much. I didn't even know what triggering meant. I just knew it affected me. Like, and there was things I was like, I don't know why, but I know this is like real history. Somehow this is true. I had that feeling even as a kid about Star Wars. Um, And, and I, you know, Star Trek, same thing. I was like, this is real. I don't know why or how I knew that, you know, at the ages that I felt that, but I did. So I just look like, okay, whatever, (laughs) just blow past that. 
do, do you think your husband may have been in the program as well? And that's why you had that initial attraction to him? Did he ever have any? Yeah. yeah. Well, he was in the Navy. Okay. Um, and he knew about quantum entanglement and different things about physics before I did. And so I was, as I was waking up, I was just doodling, you know, different things. And, and he had to sit there and snicker about it, you know, like, what? And, and I would show him and then I would tell him what I had been, what I just heard, you know, in my head. And, and he's like, mm -hmm. and, and he finally, one day just said, yeah, that's what this is called quantum entanglement. And I just looked at him and I was like, you're just now telling me and you already knew all of this. <laughs> I was mad. And he goes, well, it was fun watching you. <laughs> I was just like, oh. So we started watching Ancient Aliens and um, uh, we loved that show. Oh my goodness, we loved that. And um, and then he got cancer. Um, well, uh, we got into a, a group that was... Hmm, I don't know if I want to talk about that yet. <laughs> um, but we got into a group together and that was basically um, trying to take back the constitutional rights, you know. And um, he was always very much into history and genealogy. So he was doing my genealogy because somebody in my family already had a lot of it already done. So he just took it further back and he was like, oh my gosh, no wonder you're like you are. You've got this, you've got this and you're related to Jesus. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> and um, so that's how that came about. But um, we, we were very curious. I would stay up sometimes till four o'clock in the morning just on the internet looking at all this stuff. And um he got cancer and and it just like it just hit him and so that changed our focus and but that's that's how I how this all evolved you know I, I don't know if you want to know more about that but he he you know he he fought for three years he he had the surgery um we tried to do a lot of um, natural um, things and I fought to have him on some, uh, it was, it was superfoods while he was doing his chemo, you know, and I was like, look, I'm a pharmacy technician. I understand why you don't want him to do these things, but this is food. If you don't want him to eat because the nutrition is going to upset the chemo, that's one thing that is just absolutely crazy. I said, because, you know, because what we were doing, these ounce shots of superfruits, and they were telling him he couldn't do these. And I'm like, he can't eat. He needs some kind of nutrition. And these are just fruit fruit shots. He'll do it six hours after he has his chemo. Why can't he do this? And so, you know, I advocated like that for him, um, during that. So, um, they let him and it was, you know, there was a lot of different things that went on during the chemo. Like he, he needed like nine blood transfusions and I was learning what it meant to be, have the life in the blood during this because he changed that changed him all of these different people's blood going into him it changed him and it was his hemoglobin still would not come up and so I got him on the products that were greens and from the company that I was in and it went straight up and it stayed there 
and the pharmacist at the VA hospital was like, how is this possible? What are you doing? Oh, wait, don't tell me. I don't want to know. So there was stuff like that that happened. Um, uh, I had a psychic look into the cause of the cancer. And she said that it was CCM 134. And the place that he was stationed in Idaho Falls was the place where the first um, nuclear weapon was used for the first world war um, or second some or you know Idaho Falls <laughs> and so there was a lot of um, nu nuclear fallout in the ground there since then they've hauled a lot of the soil out to try to help the situation there but um, he worked on nuclear reactors and he ended up going colorblind while he was serving. And um, they said it was from stress and that's why he was medically discharged. So um, I still really feel like there was some things that he knew that he just didn't know how to talk about. Um, we hadn't gotten that far yet. And I, I do, I, I do know after he passed, um, I worked with a, a psychic lady that um, did like a past life regression uh, aside from me. She didn't, you know, like talk me through it or anything. She just asked my guides, what do you want to reveal to her now? And what was brought up was another lifetime where we were together, Brian and I. And he died at the age of 41 in that life. And he was Joseph Campbell, but not the one that is the popular one amongst our people. <laughs> and, um, uh, but he died at 41 and we didn't have any children. And one of the things that he said before he passed was that, um, thank you for giving me what I thought I would never have. And he was talking about the kids. I was like, but you're not going to raise them with me. Don't give up. And he's like, no, this is what I wanted. I, I'm done. And I was just like, <laughs> but so, and, and our, you know, it was interesting that our names, our last name was Campbell. He passed at 41, just like in that life. And my best friend now was my best friend then. And she looks exactly like she did then i showed it to her and she's like how is how, how do you have that picture of me that that's too old that looks just like me who is that <laughs> so you know those kind of things have been part of, they're part of my story and they're part of that aha that happens at the beginning of the awakening that starts you know that river flowing so thank you thanks for You're sharing welcome. that mm -hmm. i don't know where you want to go terry <laughs> well i i'm i'm just uh i did i was wondering you know like and i think um that uh, chastity that, that by you sharing that it's sort of with meeting your husband it 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 is a story in itself I mm -hmm. I I think you know he he's that was an important aspect for you to share with us and it sort of takes us to the understanding of where you are now and how you got there so it's yeah. like um, wow thank you. Yeah. And he yeah. sounds like a remarkable person. Yeah. Yeah. No accidents. Yeah. <laughs> no. Remarkable. Yes. Do you, and since you are um, a, a psychic and, and, and so do you, does he talk to you? Do, do, does oh, he yeah. guide you in any way? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. We, we actually made a pact before he passed that um, he would come and, and talk to me about what it's like to transition back to life. And um, 
he's helped me with the kids. Um, he picked out this house where we live. Uh, <laughs> I, his, okay, so his birth date was August 18th. And um, we were the same age, born the same year. And um, he passed away on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. And when I was filling out the application for this house, it didn't even occur to me until I looked at the address and it was 818. I'm like, oh. And then I looked at the address where I was, where my landlord is, and it was 317. I was just like, oh, well, I'm getting this place. I just know I am because he already picked it out for me. And so when I went in, I was, the lady already knew my situation that I had just lost my husband. We had had a house fire in our rental where we were before and that I, I didn't really have that great of credit, um, but I just needed somebody to take that chance on me. And so when I shared with her about the address, so she said, you already had it. I wanted to be the one to take the chance on you. But man, she started crying. She said, that is just a remarkable story. And I was like, I know, right? So I'm leaving there. I got the place. I get in the car. I had not been listening to my um, DVD player and, or my, not my DVD, but my CD player. And all of a sudden it starts playing. And the first thing that it says in this song is you're not alone so I just sat there and cried well then I had to go to office max for something and I always say thank you to the cashier and I use their name and so when I was leaving I looked at the man's tag and his name was Brian spelled exactly like my husband's and I couldn't hardly even speak I was just like, I said, thank you, Brian. And I ran out of the store bawling. <laughs> and I was just like, okay. And, and I was just like, yeah, you know, he's definitely guiding us. And there's, that's just one of countless, I've lost track of them, mm -hmm. things that have happened like that to all of us. So, okay. So, <laughs> and I have, I have another question off subject now, okay. but, but the one, the question is, tell me about the Yetis. Like, how did you, <laughs> and I, I know you probably talked about it at the conference, but how did you get to talk and tell us about the yetis like where are they from another dimension what what can you share i mean yes this this is a whole subject but you know we're going to just condense it to you know like okay. something quick <laughs> something quick so, and, and and short just yeah. that you get what you can share i think maybe it's another topic right erica <laughs> james wanted to know if i would channel the yetis and i was like yeah okay i can try that and um, so when we went in the group, I was focused on finding their energy because that is how I tune into them, like a radio station. Um, if I'm going to um, channel, that's, I, I tune into them. And um so that's what I did. And, and I heard come over here. So I started walking away from the group and over towards these bushes. And um, to me, what I saw was like um, an opening, like a, a cave um, area, not, not like a rock cave, but it was bushes. And they had this clearing that was pushed back in this one area, how I was seeing it. And um, it was like, first they told me to stop right there. So I stopped and then I was told, okay, now come forward. 
And so once I did that, um, my what I saw was like this digital green um, honeycomb sequence of lines. And um, I just kept walking and I was in another place. And I, I didn't like, I, when I came to, I had not like walked in as far as I know into these leaves of the bushes. I don't, I don't remember feeling any of those. I just, when I saw the screen, I kept going and it was like this purple swirling um, portal uh, that took me into a cave. And um, it was like a meeting. It, it kind of reminded me of like a break room type thing. And um, there was an elder sitting there and he's like, hi, <laughs> you know, I could understand him. He could understand me. And um, we talked and I didn't know that everybody else had moved on. I, I slightly remember hearing James say, where did Chastity go? But it was very stretched. And I think that was when I was going like through the portal. And, and um, I was thinking to myself, they can't see me. <laughs> and then I was there in front of, you know, the Sasquatch and, and I was like, I, I forgot all about that, you know. I was on the mission of talking to this Sasquatch about what James had told me that he would like to know. And, and I had wanted to know too because I was having some experiences when I was camping out in my car that I um, wanted to know what was going on. And, um, but there were some juvenile Sasquatch that were um, playing with me, um, kind of like my boys play with me and interact with me. They were interacting like that with me. And, um, they felt like it was okay to do that because they, and they knew me, they knew that I had boys and they knew that I had brothers, you know, that I was used to that kind of rowdiness. And, and so they felt like it would help me feel less homesick, it would, that it would kind of keep me distracted. And it did, because I was like, what the heck is going on? What are they doing to my car? <laughs> and, you know, I had a tent to sleep in and I, I went to the tent, but I just, with all the activity that I was hearing and experiencing, I honestly didn't sleep in the tent because I was a little afraid too. <laughs> and um, like there was even this one night that I saw a green light, you know, go over my tent and just, it stayed right there. And I was like, whoa, mm -mm, no, somebody knows where my tent's at and I'm not gonna be in it. <laughs> so, but, you know, um, to me, I felt like this um, elder wasn't a typical elder, like what other people had said that they had encountered. To me, he was just relaxed, chill, um, just matter of fact. He wasn't trying to be, um, what's a good word? Um, he was real. You know how we say that somebody's real, you can get in tune with them and relate to them. They're easygoing. That's how he was. And I felt like I was with him um, just for a while or, or short. I, actually, I only felt like I had been there maybe 20 minutes, not very long at all. But um, when I came back, nobody was around me. And I was by myself and I was just like, ooh, this is weird. <laughs> Why did they leave me? 
And I, I went trying to find them. And that's when I started hearing these ping noises. Um, and they were like electronic noises. And I'm in the middle of this road, this access road that has trees on either side in a, a national or a state park. And, and I'm thinking, these are some weird noises for this area. And then I started hearing like, um, a heavy breathing, you know, not like a perverted heavy breathing, but like a, just, you know, somebody that was active, you know, and I could hear their breathing. And I was like, oh, and I, I was just like, you know, once I had tuned into the elders, um, energy, I didn't have to be where he was. I could still talk to him because now I know that station. <laughs> And, and so I was like, hey, what is, what, what's going on around me? And he said, well, the juveniles are, are being ornery tonight because of the group, you know, wanting to interact. And, and I was like, oh, okay. And then I heard some sticks crack. And I was just like, mm -hmm. I'm out here because I remembered what um, the huntress had talked about, that you shouldn't necessarily be out there alone, you know? Um, if you had never done that before. And so I was like, yeah, I'm just going to go back over here where everybody's out at the campfire. And I need to ground anyways, because that was an intense experience, you know, um, getting to go through a portal like that. I mean, it was just, I don't know if I've ever, knowing that I know now, that was new for me, something new that I don't remember ever. I'm sure I probably have done it before somewhere else, but I don't remember it. And so that was new for me. And I just wanted to sit and be with it. So I, I returned, said, well, the group's going to find where they are and eventually we'll reconnect. And so I just, I actually didn't even stop at the camp campfire. I just went down to a, a bench and just sat there <laughs> by myself and thought about what just happened. So. It was really cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. It was really cool because we walked up there and looked around and said, where's Chastity? And laid down on the road. We laid down. Well, some of us were laid on the road. Some laid in the grass. We listened to James make very horrible, horrible jokes that he, <laughs> you know, those something about all Bigfoot jokes about the toe and the foot and it was just like <laughs> and then when we, we honestly because now it makes me think about when when we first walked it walked up there I was looking to the left and I was like oh I feel a lot going on over here but then to the right there was a hole like bushes in the hole and I was like oh I feel like something's there and then oh, I, I felt so nervous but uh, we went up there and on the way back, I think her name was Laura and she and I were walking down first. So at the time when Chastity's hearing the crack, we hear the crack and me and her are arm in arm. I don't know this woman. I just met her in the dark. <laughs> and we both stop in our tracks. We don't turn around. We go like Scooby-Doo, like, step back 10, 10 steps, just go back, back, back. Like, so we're just walking backwards like, oh, <laughs> and they're like, what's wrong with y'all? <laughs> and we're like, we can hear it. But we were just in sync and we could hear it. And then they were like, no. And then James starts recording. And then the pings, ping, like he can hear the digital pings in the recording. And then it's a little snap. And then there was an animal that went past us. But whatever the snaps were, it wasn't the same as that little animal that went past mm -hmm. us. It was completely different. So the next day when he wanted to go out there by our total selves, I was like, I don't think we want to go that far. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, we're going to put these incense down here and these roses. We're going to leave this right at the beginning of the road. But Oh my gosh, I remember we met up in the room and you were telling, I was like, yes, girl, yes, I remember, yes. I was like, whoo. Yeah. It was intense yeah. because it did have this feeling of being somewhat surrounded. 
Yeah. And what's her name? K. Margie K. She'd also oh, okay. said that there were 25 of them out there. Yeah. And that some of them were looking for wives. So yeah, mm-hmm. women probably don't I'm need glad you. I walked back. <laughs> <laughs> I may not be here. <laughs> You'd have been a Sasquatch wife by now. Mm-hmm. So that was really interesting and really edgy. And I like I like creepy stuff or things where I can get myself a little creeped out and a little scared and be like, okay, that's enough for me. I gotta go. <laughs> but it was really cool too to be able to meet Jessica Jones and and, yeah. and hang out. And yeah. that that was wonderful too. Um but it seems like you just had a wonderful summer and it's leading into this beautiful thing that's going to be happening for your life. And it's, you know, you're here now and I don't think anything can stop you now, Jasmine. No. You've been pushed into the new being of who you are and the new direction. And here it is with people. Oh, yeah wanting to know more about you and wanting to meet you and um you got the gift and and i look forward to the ways that you share it in the future and there goes my son in the background so you know i'm sorry the cat just didn't crawl across the screen but yeah i had to feed him a couple of times anyway but uh so when are when are you going to montauk um august 10th through the 16th wow so that's like in uh three weeks yep three weeks yep. well we're wishing you all the best on that i know james has been talking about this montauk for a long time but now it's like okay now i have a better way better understanding of what it is so yeah. Yeah. expectations are no you're going to meet some really cool people from different countries yeah. and different parts of uh even the united states and that's mm-hmm. always you know that's going to be great just like our trip to illinois was absolutely amazing so yeah, yeah. and terry it was nice to meet you terry <laughs> Well, it was lovely to meet you, Chastity, and I'm I'm looking forward to um, hearing about your adventures uh, in August. Yeah, most definitely. definitely. Most yeah, definitely. Come, come come back and share with us if you can. Yes, okay. for sure. For sure. Okay. Um, had you you don't have a website yet? No, not yet. Any information you want to share so that if you can have contact. Um, right now, Facebook is my contact. Okay. Um, I, I'm easing into this. I don't, I don't want to get overwhelmed. Um, but I'm easing into this and just going with the flow. Um, I, this week is all about uh, in enrolling kids into school <laughs> yeah yeah and paying bills and stuff like that so it's I was you know one of the things that did keep me to from um, even even when I was going to church you know I didn't want that responsibility of um having to answer for more than my four <laughs> I know and, what you mean yeah, it's it's hard to juggle, you know, because back then, you know, since I was homeschooling and everything, like I had a calendar for everything. My life was completely scheduled. Now I'm going with the flow, but I still, you know, I have my family. I still have a kid in school. Um, I'm I'm still healing. I'm still discovering who I am, um, and I I have to have enough energy for you know, my family, not that energy ever runs out, but, you know, I'm learning how to juggle this. And so I am working on it. On um. We've discussed this before because <laughs> yeah. plenty of people are gifted. And um, a lot of times people spend a lot of time conjuring and doing instead of being. 
And if right. they have the thought that they are in charge of saving the whole world by themselves and end up exerting way more energy than they can afford to just, you know, trying to do this. And uh, we had a discussion about the Teal Swan. So I never judge <laughs> Teal Swan on her methods or anything like that. I don't judge it. But what I saw was once you decide you want to help people, how much do you want to help? Like, do you want to be responsible for people's lives or do you want to push, show them away and allow them on their own path? And I think a lot of healers maybe get caught up in fixing, saving and helping. Uh, and like, I think it was you and I discussing, everybody thinks that they're Neo when you're really just the Oracle. Right. Yeah, See, right. even the Oracle, she didn't really answer the question. She said, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And she might trigger thoughts and directions and maybe, uh, what do you call it? Agitate the surface to make things rise up, but not necessarily paint the picture for you. You have to paint the picture for yourself because right, it's based on right. your beliefs. So I'm totally of that same belief that how much responsibility do you want to have for people and how many people do you really want to communicate with? Because it is a lot of energy. And I think a lot of times some people take on more, you know, because once you write, once you write a book, it becomes somebody's Bible. <laughs> In yes, some cases, yes, yes, it's yes. like a double edged sword of. <laughs> yeah. I think Chastity, you were with me yesterday when I was being miss righteous and like i just wanted to help and i'm like here i'm getting i'm gonna get kicked in the butt and i know i'm about to get kicked in the butt i'm gonna do it anyway and uh <laughs> and we came here to experience things so that we could learn and yeah it's not necessarily that we're gonna master but we're gonna learn yeah. you know the limits that should or shouldn't be crossed for us it, you know, uh, this is our journey. We're not living for everybody else, even though we might have a contract, you know, an agreement of some sort of, of interaction. It's this is our journey. And I, I think that, you know, everybody that I usually come across, um, they don't want to be told what to do. They just maybe want to get some guidance they want to hear what your story is so that they can have confirmation about their story yeah you know? and that's that's what i think is more important is just listening to each other because you know so my you know since my foundation is a more biblical background you know one of the things that i i learned is that you know we're saved by our testimony you know, that's our story and the way that we help one another because it takes a village is we share our story so that it helps somebody else encourage, guide, whatever it is, spark, trigger, whatever. But we need to share our story and be real because that's what's going to get us going where we need to go. Even what you said about, um, like regressions and frank so i and we've talked about it and i was just thinking about it the, the other day is like how many regressions do you need how many memories do you need how many past lives do you need when we're actually at this point where we're calling in the fragments to be healed now some of those regressions can help to Help you understand that, okay, this reality that we're talking about, these things that we're talking about, this paranormal, um, this quantum entanglement, that all these things really are real. So it helps confirm the, re the reality that, yes, this really is happening, and, and just like we say. Now that I know what I know, let me call in the fragments and begin to heal and integrate all this so that all all the information that I've taken from all these lifetime can help me live this lifetime the best. Not that I always need to predict the future. I don't always need to know, but that at that correct time, 
the answer is known and I know what to do in that situation. And so I think that's why I really enjoy talking to you because I'm like, yes, you are so, you know, Cassidy is not like, I can't wait for this to be over or I can't wait for the Federation to call or, you know, um, you know, that's how we get addicted to to buying certain crystals and devices. Like we got to have all the devices and got to have all the crystals and we got to know all the formulas. And so, so I think a lot of people get so caught up into the knowing instead of the being. And like you were saying with the heart, because information, sometimes I think it blocks mm-hmm. a lot of people because they want to know everything all the time. And that's why they get addicted. I got to have all the readings and we get a reading every day and and is he with me? Is he for me? Is he, you know, is he the one? And and uh, and stuff like that. But I feel like you're just so grounded in yourself, and I think you're just amazing. So just thought I'd say that. And I just like talking to you because it's just like you say things. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> like I think you know, resonance. when we start putting everything together and realizing that. These are just modalities. These are just tools. These are just belief systems. These are filters. You know, all these words that we use. What it comes down to is we're learning to trust ourselves. We're learning to love ourselves, period. Yeah. And eventually we're going to break off all these training wheels and we won't need any of them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's wonderful. It's wonderful to talk to you. Carrie, I don't know if you had any more to say. No, I'm I'm just I, I've enjoyed spending this last couple of hours with you, Chastity, and getting to know you and your story and and your uh, amazing um, take on things and 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 how you are uh, developing because that's so it, it, it's so important for for people to realize that you know what, they can open up to whatever they have to do whenever is the right time and the appropriate time for them. And, and, you know, the assistant is going to come from our higher self. And Mm -hmm. you're going to have the memories when you're ready for them, and you'll integrate things as you're ready for them. And so uh, a lot of times, uh, people are saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, like, what's wrong with me? It's like, no, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing right now, you're being here. And a lot of times people forget how important it is just to be present, and be present Mm -hmm. in the moment instead of worrying about, you know, um, six months down the road. It's like, now this is where we need to be right now and uh, enjoy those moments because like we just were saying, we don't know when when those moments may not be there. And so it's important to be grounded in the present moment because that's where the, that's where our power is, is right here, right now, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, you think about a puzzle and you're putting a puzzle together and you've got 20 to 30 pieces of the ocean, but there's 20 to 30 pieces of the ocean. And if one of them's missing, you have a hole in your puzzle. So sometimes it's not that you're not special, but you're special where you are. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to be all the things all the time. Yeah. 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 I love that. We're we're all we're all entangled. We're all Mm -hmm. part of the whole. And each one of us carries a light, like you said. You know, yeah. like that we, we are a piece of the puzzle. And so, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes the, those pieces haven't come together yet. So we're just holding on to yeah. filling in that piece when, when it's, when it's there, it will come. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we will say good evening or good afternoon or whatever time you're watching and say, thank you. Give us some thumbs up, share, um, leave your fingerprint. That's what I like to say. And um, definitely, if you have any questions, put them in the comments or feel free to reach out. But, you know, just let us know what you think and how it resonated. And uh, our links for Terry and I are in the uh, 
description and we'll talk to you really, really soon as we continue to fly through the galaxy and pick up more, <laughs> more people and find out what in the heck is going on in their part of the world. So thank you so much. We're going to put, to, we're going to put the puzzle together. Peace. Yes. Peace. Peace. Yes. Peace. yes. And thank you. And good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.